Okay, now we're going to look at our psalm, and uh, it's uh, Psalm 92. I don't think I have anyone who signed up to read that, so I'll, I'll go ahead and take us through that. Uh, the, the response is, Lord, it is good to give thanks to you. Lord, it is good to give thanks to you. It is good to give thanks to the Lord to sing praise to your name, Most High, to proclaim your kindness at dawn and your faithfulness throughout the night. Lord, it is good to give thanks to you. <clears throat> the just one shall flourish like the palm tree, like a cedar of Lebanon shall he grow. They that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Lord, it is good to give thanks to you. <clears throat> they shall bear fruit even in old age. Vigorous and sturdy shall they be, declaring how just is the Lord, my rock, in whom there is no wrong. Lord, it is good to give thanks to you. And if you look closely, you'll see we take uh, the first two verses of the psalm, two and three, and then it jumps to uh, 13 to 16. And those verses were picked specifically for today because of the, the image of a cedar of Lebanon uh, as the reward of the just. And this, uh, this fits right in with Ezekiel's vision of, of the trees. So that's why the liturgist chose this particular, those particular verses from the psalm. Uh, uh, oh, I'm going into my presentation. I don't need to do that. First, uh, are there any uh, words or phrases or images that struck you while I was going through that? Well, of course, the one that struck me was uh, cedar of uh, cedar of Lebanon. Find it in a minute. Like a cedar of Lebanon, just because it. No explanation needed. <laughs> Any other words or images? And an image that comes to me is uh, from when I was doing archaeology in the summer in, in Jordan. And uh, you can always tell where the little streams are, like you're riding on the highway, and over there off in the distance, in the middle of the desert, you'll see this zigzag green line. <laughs> that's, 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 where the green, that's where the water is. Uh, uh, and, and you don't see it all the time and you just see it every now and then. And, and so when you're looking at a lot of brown sand and then suddenly, oh, oh, look way over there, there's this green line zigzagging, maybe zigzagging down from the mountain or whatever. It's, it's wonderful. Okay. Um, what do I have here now? I like that line, the Lord, my rock. Ah, the Lord, my rock. Okay. It's kind of different. Yes. Yes. It's, uh, it, it occurs uh, several, more, more than a few times in, in the Old Testament. Uh, let me just, uh, just see if I can do a quick, all the verses that have Lord and rock in them. Uh, huh. uh, there, are, there are 29 such verses. Uh, every one of them in the Old Testament, never in the New Testament, and uh, 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 and not all of them call the Lord rock. For instance, the first one, and the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me where you can stand upon the rock. So uh, what I would have to do is go through these 29 verses and find the, the ones where the Lord is called rock. So, uh, 
And then <clears throat> in the New Testament, do we have very many upon this rock? Uh, that know? only occur occurs as far as I'm concerned in, in Matthew's gospel. Okay. Uh, upon this rock. Uh, uh, didn't occur in the RSV at all. Let me get our good Catholic Bible here. <laughs> surely, surely we'll do it this way. Upon this rock. Uh, Matthew 16, 18 is the only verse in the entire Bible that has that phrase. And, uh, oh, and the RSV has on this rock instead of upon this rock. But is it only Matthew that <clears throat> appears that oh. it's where the rock is peter uh yes uh well, <clears throat> there, actually he's called you know, sometimes you'll see his name kephas uh. cephas kephas and kepha is the aramaic the syriac word for rock so uh uh that's the place <clears throat> where uh uh and, and there's a place in john i think uh uh, Simon, who, whom he named uh, Kephas. Uh, so it, it occurs several times, but on this rock or upon this rock, that's just Matthew. <clears throat> okay. That, that's why Matthew is the favorite gospel of the Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's why if you ever visit St. Saint, Saint Peter in Rome, around the, where the, the dome is, You'll see in letters that are taller than I am, but you can read them easily from the floor. Tu es Petrus et super hunk Petram edificabo ecclesia mea. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, written uh, uh, in Latin uh, under the dome at St. Peter's. Yeah, this is our favorite verse as Catholics. We love it. Hmm. Uh, okay, so... So for my presentation, if anyone asks you why Lord is in all capitals in the psalm, uh, now you, you can tell them. You know the answer because of my last presentation. Uh, but why is Lord not in all capitals in the response? Lord, it is good to give thanks to you. It's because the response is not translating from the Hebrew. It's <clears throat> just a, a poetical response that the church decided to, to use, and maybe they got it from the Latin Bible or the Greek Bible, or maybe they, they made it up, but they're not directly quoting, they're not translating the Hebrew, and so it's not in all capitals uh, in, Lord, it is good to give thanks to you, in the response that everybody repeats. So the, if you're looking at the lectionary, the, uh, the, the psalm itself Lord is spelled differently than the psalm, than the response that everybody says. Uh, and now you know why. Uh, a remark from Reginald Fuller, uh, the Anglican scholar who uh, preaching the lectionary, preaching the lectionary. Uh, the psalm expresses the Deuteronomistic theology a viewpoint that has to be balanced by that of other works, such as the book of Job, which recognizes that the righteous do not always prosper. So Deuteronomistic theology, what is that? God rewards goodness. Specifically, God rewards fidelity to the covenant. God punishes wickedness, specifically infidelity to the covenant. The theology gets its name from the Deuteron book of Deuteronomy and the Deuteronomistic history. Deuteronomy purports to be the final sermon of Moses, and it continually emphasizes these things, these themes. Here is part of the reading that we read on the Feast of the Holy Trinity from chapter 4. Therefore, you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you this day, that it may go well with you and with your children after you. So blessings follow good behavior, and that you may prolong your days, a long life, 
is a blessing for good behavior in the land which the Lord your God gives you forever. This is not individual life forever. It's that the people will live in the land of Israel forever. Deuteronomy serves as the preface to the Deuteronomistic history, which is Joshua, Judges, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings. Those who wrote the Deuteronomistic history consider the destruction of Israel, the 10 northern tribes, and the destruction of Judah, the two southern tribes, to be the result of worshiping other gods. And they are convinced that these disasters would not have happened if Israel and Judah had worshipped only the Lord, if they had not played politics with foreign kings, and part of being allied with foreign kings is you have to honor their gods. If, you, if, you, if your master is the king of Babylon or Pharaoh in Egypt, you have to honor their gods uh, in your temple. That's the way politics work. Uh, so now... There is an opposing view in the Bible, in a book that's sometimes called Ecclesiastes and sometimes called Koheleth. If you have an old Douay Bible, you'll find two books. One is called Ecclesiastes, and the other is called Ecclesiasticus. Uh, it's, and if you want to abbreviate the, like, I think the first eight letters, maybe more, are the same. <laughs> uh, and the, the names now in the New American Bible are, uh, I think, Koheleth and Sirach. And it's a lot easier to tell Koheleth and Sirach apart than it is to tell Ecclesiastes and Ecclesiasticus apart. <clears throat> and he says, in my vain life, I have seen everything. Vain here means empty. He begins with vanity of vanities, everything is empty, that nothing has any meaning. Uh, he says, I've seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness. Hey, you Deuteronomistic guys, you say God reward. I, I have seen a righteous man perish. And there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. I've seen it. Uh, and so then we get, be not righteous over much, and don't make yourself overwise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not wicked over much, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? So Koheleth has seen everything. He's not going to rely on what prophets have said or Moses has said. He's looking at what he's seen with his own eyes, and he's telling you this is the way the world works. Uh, some good people die young. Some wicked people live a long time. I don't care what the Deuteronomists say. So his conclusion is, don't be too good. It's not worth the prop. It's not worth the trouble. Be not righteous over much. So, you know, uh, sometimes the idea for us is, well, you can never be good enough. No matter how good you are, uh, you're not perfect. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, Jesus told us. But, but in the same Bible, Kohelis says, <laughs> don't be too good. It's, it's not worth the trouble. And uh, don't be too wicked. God will slap you down. Uh, the idea, notice, is not that God who's seeing everything and paying attention to every detail of every life that everybody does, uh, God knows that people sin, and Koheleth's God, he's not too upset about that, as long as they're just regularly bad you know, normal human badness. But if you're really wicked, if you're stupid enough, if you're a fool to be so bad that you stand out from being wickedness, God will slap you down. So don't be a fool. Some fools get away with it, but most of them don't. <clears throat> then another uh, opposing view comes from Job. In the introduction of Job, the first two chapters, the omniscient narrator 
tells the reader that Job was blameless and upright in chapter 1, and even the Lord himself twice admits to the angels in heaven that Job is blameless and upright, once in chapter 1, once in chapter 2. Uh, uh, anyone who mentions the patience of Job has not read much of the book. Job is patient for the first two chapters, and then from chapter 3 to chapter 37, he gripes a whole lot. Uh, here's one sample from chapter 9. It is all one, therefore I say. He destroys both the blameless and the wicked. You Deuteronomists say he destroys the wicked, but he saves the, 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 the righteous. I say, no, I, I've seen it. He's like Kohelet. He destroys the, the blameless as well as the wicked. Uh, when disaster brings sudden death, he mocks at the calamity of the innocent. What does God do when there's an earthquake or a tidal wave or a hurricane? Job says, <laughs> he, he laughs at all the innocent people who are suffering. Uh, so much for the patience of Job. <clears throat> the earth is given into the hands of the wicked. He covers the face of its judges. If it's not he, who then is it? Uh, who is it who makes judges blind so that they rule in favor of the guilty and condemn the innocent? God is the one who blinds them. Uh, my point here is not who's right and who's wrong. My point is the Bible contains very different opinions about how God acts in the world. I once suggested to my study buddy, Rabbi Klein, that we read more of the Psalms. And David doesn't like to read all of the Psalms because too many of them are Deuteronomistic. And when many modern Jews read Psalms like uh, uh, blessed is the man who follows not the counsel of the wicked and, and uh, enters into the company of the scorners and so on, uh, they say BS. We have seen the Holocaust. The Jews in Germany did nothing to deserve that. The Jews of U Europe did nothing to deserve that. We don't accept this Deuteronomistic theology. We're not going to read it or preach it. <clears throat> uh, and so now some still do, but there are a lot of there are a lot of Jews who say we have had it up to here with Deuteronomistic theology. So my, my point is that uh, there are very different views uh, in, in the Bible about how God behaves. Uh, and here's the proclamation uh, uh, from the uh, NABRE, slightly different version. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name most high, to proclaim your love at daybreak, your faithfulness in the night. The just shall flourish like the palm tree. They sh shall grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bear fruit even in old age. They will stay fresh and green to proclaim the Lord is just my rock in whom there is no wrong. So, uh, questions, comments, observations. Uh, and one that comes to me, uh, a, a catechetical Christian. Uh, what motive do we teach children for being good? Why should they be good? Uh, and, and why should adults be good? <laughs> That's... A question I have. Any any questions that anyone else or observations?
How, how many times when we hear a scripture reading do we think B.S.? It's, it's probably not frequent. Uh, spiritual writers call that resistance. And uh, like if you go to a spiritual director and you say, you know, I was reading this passage and, and I just thought B.S. Uh, and they'll say, well, where is this resistance coming from? And they will get you to talk about what experiences in your life are inspiring this resistance. And uh, it's uh, a good spiritual director will help you to discern, is this resistance, is this BS, uh, is this coming from God himself, from the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, or is it coming from flesh, from human weakness, from an evil spirit? So the fact that there's resistance at times to the words of Scripture, uh, as far as spiritual writers are concerned, uh, that's a normal part of being a human being. Uh, but once we realize that there's resistance, then to advance spiritually, we need to learn where the resistance is coming from in my particular life. I notice in the in the Catholic connection there are uh, some uh, people who have done spiritual director uh, training and they write different articles in the Catholic and it, I think uh, like Mike Van Franken spiritual director you'll see you you can't just put spiritual director behind your name you have to complete a course of studies to to do that but those kind of people they're good at helping you discern things. So put in a, a, a plug for our diocesan spiritual directors. And maybe, maybe someone who is in uh, here today or sees the Zoom recording, maybe one of them is interested in pursuing, uh, maybe God's calling you to be a spiritual director. At, at, at times, uh, almost all hospital chaplains were Catholic priests. Uh, now, the majority of Catholic hospital chaplains are not ordained priests. Uh, they're deacons, they're uh, nuns, and there are lay people. And priests are now a minority. The same thing is happening in spiritual direction. At one time, all spiritual directors uh, were priests. But now, more and more laity uh, have the training. And as a matter of fact, they're, they're better trained uh, than people like me. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, uh, I, I am a trained hospital chaplain. Uh, uh, often people think, that, well, because someone has completed the seminary, uh, they, they have what it takes to be, they have the training, the necessary training to be a hospital chaplain. That's that's not a safe assumption. Or they have the necessary training to be a spiritual director. Uh, when I arrived at the seminary at Baltimore, they told me that part of my job would be I would be a spiritual director for, uh, I think, five or six students. And uh, I told them, I said, I feel very qualified to teach uh, scripture but I've had no specialized training in spiritual direction. Well, we're going to give you some in services. And, and I'm thinking, okay, to teach scripture for them, I need not a master's degree, I need a PhD. But uh, to be a spiritual director, uh, a, a couple of in services, that, that's enough. Um, it, it seems to me that at least some seminaries don't take spiritual direction uh, as seriously as they take academic formation. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an acad academic. I, I think that learning and PhDs are, are important, but, but I think that when we're 
training our people in, in, for ministry, whether they're seminarians or, uh, or training them for lay ministry, I think that trained, having trained spiritual directors is at least as important as having trained instructors. I'm, I'm on board to be a trained instructor. I don't have the training to be a trained spiritual director. Uh, many of the laity, well, there's not a lot, but we have a small group of laity who are uh, better trained. And I've, I've thought in my retirement that maybe I would want to get some spiritual direction training, but I, I haven't gone for it yet. Other questions, comments, observations? I can ramble forever. Father Pat. As you're talking about that, Father, before our class started, I <laughs> made the mistake of picking up the morning paper. Oh. <laughs> and I looked down at the bottom of the front page, and I really had a lot of trouble getting myself together for this class because I was reading something that I'm thinking about right now, what would you say to this mom and dad? The story, I mean, rather the article is simply, Calvary teen dies in a boating accident. Mm -hmm. And there's just a brief discussion of, of how the accident happened. There were two boys, 15 years old. One went under and he came right back up. The other one went under and went into the current and they followed the body or the child for quite a while. It, that's as far as I got it. I just had to put it down because I thought I, all I need to do, that's funny that you, you're, you're, you're touching something, I guess it's personal to me. All I could do was think this little boy is gone and his mom and dad have the rest of their lives to get through this. And what would I say? Mm -hmm. What would I say? God is good. God is good. And, and you know, I, I realize you're correct, Father. I think what you're saying is so correct. I think that priests are supposed to be able, when I was young, get the answer. He's going to tell you something and it's going to work. And it's going to, all that pain's going to be over because you're going to get it. And it's just not you struggle. I, I get the picture of struggling, struggling even with God, trying to get to what is this? What's going on here? With all the evil that's going on, this kid gets in the current. What, what we learn in, we have a little bit of pastoral counseling in most seminaries. Yeah. And one of the first things you need to learn is what is something where I can be helpful? And what is something that's beyond my skills where I need mm -hmm. to make a referral? So mm -hmm. a, a, a good priest needs to, in his parish or in his town, he needs to know some good Catholic or at least religious people who share our values, who are counselors that, that say, well, you know, <clears throat> and, and then you, you refer them. And the way that you make a referral is uh, uh, you don't sh shoot people off, but you say, you know, this is more complicated than I think that so-and-so can help you. Here is their telephone number. Uh, please get in touch with them. And I want you to get back with me and let, you, let me know how things are going. So you're not... Uh, uh, yeah. And then the other thing you learn in in Counseling 101 and also in specialized uh, uh, chaplaincy training is that what you say is of minimal importance. Uh, what's most important is that you listen very, very carefully. So what's most important is, uh, is that you, you listen to what people are saying and, uh, and, and what you hear guides your response. And, uh, and you, have, you have choices. Uh, 
you can focus on con content like uh, that mine or yours. Uh, Now you might need to mute yourself. You can. Okay, I got it. Oh, okay, uh, 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 and sometimes you can reflect back what you're hearing. Uh, so your 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 son drowned, and uh, uh, or you can reflect back the emotion that you're hearing. Uh, I, 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 I see that that you are are deeply grieved. Uh, and uh, so the more than anything you say is how much, how much you listen and, uh, uh, and to, uh, so the, the main ministry, whether it's hospital chaplain or counselor or parish priest or uh, is, uh, is to develop uh, your listening skills. And so people who are spiritual directors and counselors and chaplains, we, we all have uh, good, we go through similar listening skills, but then what, what each minister does with that is very different. Uh, but thanks for bringing that up. Well, looks like we're, we're, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording here. Stop recording. <laughs>